السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Our lecture today is going to be about the approach to a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus. Of course, we know that systemic lupus erythematosus is a very common disease that we face in in practice. Uh, and uh, any doctor from any uh, branch uh, should know uh, about it uh, very uh, uh, well. Uh, because we call the systemic lupus erythematosus, we call it the imitator. It's a systemic autoimmune disease. Uh, it can uh, affect the connective tissue, and since connective tissue is in, at any part of the body, so it is by default that systemic lupus erythematosus can affect any organ in the body. Uh, systemic lupus erythematosus is a disease that you can find in all kinds of clinics. Uh, if you go to a dermatology clinic, you will find patients with systemic lupus. If you go to the nephrology clinics, you will find patients with systemic uh, lupus. If you go uh, to uh, the rheumatology, if you go even to the gastroenterology or neurology, any clinic can find uh, patients with uh, systemic lupus uh, erythematosus. It's an autoimmune uh, uh, disease uh, that can cause, of course, inflammation and the damage to the tissues. Uh, it is, uh, if we uh, recall the types of hypersensitivity reactions, it is type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, which is depending on antibody immune complex fixation. What is this information beneficial for us? It is beneficial for us that when we know that it, uh, it depends on the complement to fix the reaction and make the antigen antibody uh, reaction, this is uh, uh, the cause why in cases of systemic lupus, we always find that there is consumption of the complex uh, factor inside the body. And uh, from that uh, 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 point, we can use the level of complement in the body as a form of follow-up of our patients and determination of the disease uh, activity, uh, of course. Uh, okay, so I have a problem a little bit in, the, in admitting people while I am speaking. Okay, so um, there are, of course, a very common organ that is affected by systemic lupus. Of course, like the joints, the blood vessels, kidneys, heart, and nervous system. Uh, 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 the course of the disease is unpredictable. Uh, it is always uh, goes through something called flares. Flare is when the disease is active or affecting actively uh, a certain or through some parts where the disease activity is controlled, maybe by medications, and we call these times, we call them remissions. It occurs, of course, more common in females, and this is one of the very, very rare diseases that can occur in males more than in males. Of course, we know about that. We cannot uh, reject this uh, fact. And it is commonly to affect females in the uh, uh, childbearing period. And uh, because of that, it is always believed that there is some effect on hormones and fertility about the disease. And it is always, almost, uh, we cannot find the disease after menopause or after uh, the uh, succession of uh, 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 the hormonal uh, uh, depression uh, uh, in, in, in older ages of uh, uh, females. Okay? So, uh, all this is uh, introduction, yes. Um, um, we call, of course, it, uh, this was, uh, 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 this is a chronic disease. It cannot be cured. There is no cure for it, but it is controllable uh, uh, by medications. And of course, the medications depend on immune uh, uh, suppression because there is still no currently, there is currently no uh, uh, exact treatment for uh, such uh, a disease. Of course, with the advancement of medical service, we uh, seldom now see cases of systemic uh, lupus. Of course, uh, the survival is very high, 95% five years, 90% for 10 years, and 78% for years. So we are speaking at, about a disease that uh, 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 can make a survival 
78% in uh, uh, for over 20 years. So we are speaking about a disease that is, uh, yes, it can be debilitating. It can affect the quality of life of patients, but it is not uh, uh, directly accurate. Okay. How can we approach a case of systemic lupus erythematosus? Okay, let us uh, 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 now um, expect the case scenario. Its case scenario is a case of 25-year-old lady with a fever of one month duration with generalized myalgia, pain and swelling in the small joints of uh, uh, both uh, uh, hands uh, and feet with easy uh, uh, fatigability. Yeah, okay. What is this patient uh, having now? We can see that she's having myalgia and she's having swelling or arthritis in the small joints along with easy fatigability. The examination revealed pallor, uh, an erythematous malar rash, areas of non-scarring alopecia, and an ulcer on the inner aspect of the cheek. Her hemoglobin living was 5.5. So now we can summarize the findings that she's having arthritis, she's having fatigue, she's having myalgia, she's having a rash and alopecia and an ulcer in the inner side of the, of the cheek as well as anemia. Okay, so we will want to answer certain questions like what is the provisional diagnosis? Of course, this is not a very smart question because we are speaking about systemic lupus erythematosus today. So whenever I'm asking about a diagnosis, it would be of course systemic lupus erythematosus. But I am asking that this question might come to you in the exam. If there is a case scenario and you can think of this patient, you can think as a systemic lupus. We will know, want to know what are the laboratory tests to make to confirm the diagnosis. How can we explain her anemia if there is uh, uh, multiple forms of anemia in patients of lupus, and uh, uh, can we expect more abnormalities in her blood picture? Okay, we will uh, now uh, 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 see a second scenario, okay? In the second scenario, there is a 24-year-old uh, uh, female presenting with precordial pain, pain in the chest, uh, in the precordial area, there was, it's present for one week, intermittent first, but now it's nearly continuous. The pain is aching and central, sometimes worsening on lying flat, and sometimes it's worsening with inspiration. So we are speaking about something that is affecting probably the precordium of the heart, not uh, something that is affecting the coronary uh, system or the muscles of the uh, heart. She had progressive shortness of breath, particularly on lying flat. Uh, she suffered from Raynaud's phenomena, which is a vascular phenomena, as we can uh, uh, know, of course, uh, that is causing uh, 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 pallor, uh, then uh, followed by bluish discoloration. And after the uh, uh, disappearance of that, there is rebound hyperflow that is causing erythema and swelling. Uh, oral ulcers, arthralgia, and intermittent fever. There is a pericardial rub that is audible by the stethoscope, and her chest is clear. Her hemoglobin is 10.5, white cell count is 3.4, and sedimentation rate is high, very high, 99 millimeters in the uh, first hour. Of course, there is no uh, much uh, difference uh, about uh, measuring the sedimentation rate in the second hour. And now, uh, clinically, we usually say they measure the sedimentation rate only in the first hour. Rheumatoid factor was uh, negative. Okay. So this is our second case that is presenting with uh, unusual presentation, presentation in the pericardium, and her chest X-ray is just showing cardiomegaly. We need full diagnosis, enumerate diagnostic criteria found in this patient, and how can we confirm the diagnosis? We will go to the third case. Of course, we will answer all this in the, in the end. The third case is a 28-year-old lady presented with puffiness of the eyelids, of course, Professor uh, Amin Rojdi, who is the professor of uh, nephrology, will be very glad by this case. 28-year-old lady presented with puffiness of eyelids and edema of the lower limbs of a two-month duration. The patient was diagnosed, of course, by systemic lupus one year uh, ago, so we don't have any uh, kind of uh, privilege by diagnosing this patient is with systemic uh, lupus. And uh, since that, she had uh, mucocutaneous and musculoskeletal uh, uh, manifestations. 
Well, now the examination shows the male rash, tender metacarpophalangeal joints, wrist, knees, but the new finding that her blood pressure is high. It is 170 over 110. Okay, this is by far our uh, introduction, and these are the three case uh, scenarios that we can commonly meet on in practice. We need to explain uh, the current situation, how we can prove the assumption, and how can we manage, manage that. Okay, so as we said in the beginning that uh, lupus, we call it the great imitator. It's the great actor. The great actor that any symptom or sign in your body is can be attributed to systemic lupus erythematosus. This is by far the part that can affect. It's a, it's a picture for the whole body. But let's call, let us recall the common manifestations, which are dermatologic manifestations like Miller uh, rash, like discoid uh, lupus, like alopecia, mouse, nasal ulcers, vaginal ulcers, musculoskeletal. 90% of patients they have affection of the joints and the muscle. There is marked uh, 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 great and, and, and percent of patients having uh, 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 anemia and having hematologic affection. It's almost one half of patients uh, drop of their platelets and maybe also affection of the white blood cells. In the uh, 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 cardiology or in the cardiac patients, uh, they can also be affected by lupus. And if we can recall from the third year in the pathology, we uh, had studied something called the lipman sac endocarditis, which is a non-infective endocarditis uh, caused by the autoimmune reaction uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, lupus. And like the case we discussed, the case number two, it can cause uh, precarditis and precardial effusion and also can present with myocarditis. Of course, there is pulmonary affection. And I can recall that in the master degree, there was a common question about the pulmonary affections in systemic lupus because they are very common. It can cause pleuritis, pleural effusion, lupus nephritis, uh, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary embolization, uh, uh, alveolar hemorrhages, and something called shrinking lung syndrome, which is the capacity of the lung shrinks as a result of the fibrosis that can cause a decrease in the lung capacity. Okay, so what are other systems that can be affected? As we can, we say that it can affect any part of the body. Of course, lupus nephritis. <laughs> we have Professor Amin. And because lupus nephritis is a very important entity, the, uh, there is a modification of the World Health Organization to classify the lupus nephritis from very, very, very uh, normal finding, which is class one, to the very advanced sclerosing glomerulonephritis and in the stage renal disease. And of course, in the medical practice, we can say, uh, see many patients uh, uh, in the uh, uh, nephrodialysis units because of uh, lupus and, of course, patients of renal transplantation. Neuropsychiatric manifestation, it can almost cause anything in neurology, it's starting from headache, cognitive dysfunctions, mood disorders, cerebrovascular diseases like strokes, seizures, polyneuropathy, increased intracranial tension uh, or called intracranial hypertension syndrome, anything, the productive system like the spontaneous abortions, uh, and of course, as we said, there is some hormonal impact, so disease tends to flare during pregnancies. And of course, the systemic manifestations like the uh, uh, fatigue, it can also affect uh, uh, by, the, by the autoimmune reaction uh, other organs, like for uh, example, it can affect the thyroid, uh, it can affect uh, uh, any other disease. Of course, in the beginning, uh, uh, there was uh, something called the American College of Rheumatology uh, criteria, and it was updated by the year 1997. I don't think that uh, most of you, <laughs> with the, none of you were, were born at that, uh, uh, at that year, 1997, and they postulated 11 criteria. Why we are still saying that, we will know by the end of the lecture, because these uh, criteria, despite there is, that there are new criteria uh, postulated later on in 2012, but these new criteria, which is called the SLIC criteria, did not render the old uh, ACR or American College of Rheumatology criteria, it did not make them obsolete. And we, I will tell you why is that. Okay. 
those criteria, there are four of them, four out of the 11, affecting the mucocutaneous part. First is the malar rash, second is the discoid rash, third is the photosensitivity, and the fourth is oral ulcers. Most of us, when we study, we just remember the, the, the title, or malar rash, discoid rash, photosensitivity, all of that. But most of us, we do not go through the description of that. Malar rash is a constant red rash over the cheekbones that spares the natural creases. Why we must uh, say that it spares the natural crease? Because if it affects the natural crease, it is not a malar rash, it is something else. Maybe discoid rash. Discoid rash does not respect the uh, nasolabial fold or, or the uh, natural uh, crease. What about the discoid rash? It is red to violaceous raised patches that can occur anywhere in the skin, not only in the butterfly uh, uh, area. And these, these lesions can be acute. It means that it, they can disappear after a while or they can be chronic, that they remain for a while. And in chronic cases, they can cause even pigmentation and the scarring and uh, 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 loss of hair in the areas that is affected by the discoid rash. Photosensitivity. Photosensitivity is a skin reaction to sunlight. Skin reaction to sunlight. It does not mean that when we go in the sunlight or in hot areas, we become red. Anybody who is fair skin, white, when he go to the sun, he will become red and sweaty. This does not, not, does not mean that, uh, 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 it means it does not mean that this is a photosensitivity. Photosensitivity is a, a rash manifested and demonstrated as uh, at the areas that are uh, exposed to the sun, which is the V-shaped area and the exposed parts of the uh, uh, neck and the arms, or of course any exposed parts also. Uh, but these are the most common parts: exposed parts to the sun and reaction in the skin. What about oral ulcers? They are ulcers and they are usually non, they are usually painless, so they are not similar to the abscess ulcers that we all experience. Most of us, of course, experience the abscess painful ulcers. No, these ulcers, they are painless, so the patient cannot complain of them unless they are secondary infected. So they are physician observed either in the mouth or in the nasopharynx. So this, is, this makes the examination of the mouth and the inside of the mouth very important part from the general examination of a patient with systemic lupus because we don't want to miss a criteria. One criteria is the ulcers in the uh, oral cavity or the nasopharyngeal part. Of course, there are some uh, pictures. This is the malar rash. Can you see the cursor? The malar rash, and the, this is the discoid rash, as we can see, it's violaceous and the scarring, and this is the photosensitivity, and this is the oral uh, ulcer. Okay, so four in the mucocutaneous. Then two plus two, two plus two is arthritis and the cirrhositis, kidney and neurology, renal and the neurologic. So this is by now four of uh, the, the mucocutaneous and four, the uh, two itis, which is arthritis and cirrhositis, and two organs, which is uh, kidney and CNS. Okay, arthritis is affecting two or more peripheral joints, upper or lower, characterized by tenderness and swelling uh, and presence of joint effusion, and they are not destructive in the X-ray. So if I go and make X-ray for a patient and I find that there is destruction and erosions, it is not because of lupus, we know that sometimes there is overlap between rheumatoid arthritis and the systemic lupus. So if I find a patient with the criteria of systemic lupus and I make X-ray and I find that there are erosions, this means that this is overlap. Commonly used rupus. It's the, it's the name is rupus. Okay. So uh, serocytis, which is either the pleural uh, membranes or the pericardial membrane, and they can be uh, dry or uh, uh, with effusion. Uh, what about the renal affection? Of course, we have said about the renal affection, but uh, uh, clinically they come with resistant uh, proteinuria or the presence of class. And of course, we've said that the classes of lupus nephritis we mentioned before, neurologic affection may be neuropsychiatric. Neuro may be in the form of, as we said, the uh, uh, seizures or uh, in the psychiatric like the form of uh, uh, psychosis, okay? Uh, uh, and now we have three things in the lab. 
So we have finished eight criteria. We have three things in the lab. First thing is the hematologic affection, which is hemolytic anemia with reticulocytosis or leukopenia uh, less than 4,000 on more than two occasions or lymphopenia less than 1,500 in two or more occasions or thrombocytopenia less than 100,000 in absence of offending drugs. I do not use a drug to, uh, uh, that can affect the platelets. Then I find that there is thrombocytopenia and I say, this is lupus. Okay. Uh, and I will go to the number 11, which is the anti-nuclear antibody, which is very, very crucial and very important. And there was a saying, uh, I, I don't remember, maybe in, in Cecil textbook of medicine, that is saying that a, a patient with negative anti-nuclear antibody uh, uh, test renders the diagnosis of lupus unlikely. It means that if you suspect a patient with lupus and find that the anti-nuclear antibody is negative, try to find an alternative diagnosis before you uh, uh, insist on, uh, 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 on saying that this is a lupus erythematosus. Uh, what is the remaining criteria? The anti-double stranded or the anti-Smith or positive findings of anti-phospholipid antibody like uh, the IgG or IgM anticardiolipin, positive test of lupus anticoagulant, or the false uh, positive of the treponema pallidum of the fluorescent uh, treponema antibody absorption uh, test. So these are the 11 uh, uh, criteria with, uh, of the American College of uh, uh, Rheumatology or the ACR, uh, which uh, 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 are um, uh, postulated on uh, 1982 uh, and revised in 1997. Okay. In 2012, the Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics, which is for, in short, we say uh, SLIC, proposed revised classification. Why is that? Because the, the, they found some limitations in the 1997 ACR criteria. What are those limitations? That uh, uh, professors of nephrology, they said that they found some patients coming uh, for them uh, only with the renal affection and they make renal biopsy and they find the pathology that is consistent with lupus nephritis. And when they make a laboratory test, they can only find that there is positive anti-nuclear antibody or, uh, or anti-nuclear antibody and anti-double-stranded DNA. If we apply the 1997 criteria, okay, nephritis, this is one, two, anti-nuclear antibody, three is anti-double stranded. It's only three criteria and we know we need four criteria. So we cannot say it is lupus. Of course, professors of nephrology, they say that this is 100% case of lupus. So uh, the Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics or the SLIC, they revised that. Also, uh, there was some concern that there are some duplication of highly correlated cutaneous features, such as mirror rash and photosensitivity. Sometimes patients, doctors were, were unable to differentiate mirror rash and photosensitivity when they affect the same area. And also lack of inclusion of some cutaneous manifestations like the uh, uh, mucolopapular or polycystic rash that the dermatology professors say always, almost always comes with patients with lupus. And there are also other neurologic affections other than seizures, especially cases of transverse myelitis. And we have found that so many cases of them come and they, diag they become diagnosed with systemic lupus uh, erythematosus, as well as there are other immunologic informations. And as I said in the beginning of my lecture, that the consumption of complement is something very common in lupus, but it was not in the criteria. So, they, when they find that, they postulated a new kind of a criteria called the SLIC criteria in the year 2012. And they divided them into clinical features, which are 11 features, and immunologic features, which are six features. The uh, 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 clinical features first is acute cutaneous lupus, mucopapular lupus, rash, Miller rash, photos, all that is considered one criteria. They consider it duplicate. And it's all under the category of acute cutaneous lupus. The second category is the discoid rash, muco mucosal lupus, other things which are chronic, and they are considered chronic cutaneous lupus. Uh, the third is the uh, mucosal or nasal uh, ulcers. And the thing that is very important, all patients of lupus, they were complaining of alopecia 
And when we revised the ACR criteria, alopecia was not a criteria, it was not just a symptom. So since so many patients, or actually most of patients, they complain of alopecia, so the SLEEK criteria included the non-scarring uh, alopecia, along with the uh, uh, synovitis uh, 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 of more than two joints, uh, cirrhositis, renal affection, neurologic affections, hemolytic anemia, leukopenia or lymphopenia, or thrombocytopenia. And we can see here that the hemolytic anemia, leukopenia, lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, which were all considered one criteria, they are now three separate criteria. So this explains why we, can, we, we usually found some, so many patients that is having hemolytic anemia and the thrombocytopenia, uh, a, a syndrome that we used to call event syndrome. And after a while, we find them having a positive antinuclear antibody or having a renal. So eventually, they were not event syndrome and they were just two criteria of the systemic lupus. What about the immunologic factors? Of course, the antinuclear antibody, which is a cornerstone, of course, in the diagnosis of lupus. Anti-double stranded is now a criteria by itself. Presence of anti-Smith, anti-phospholipid uh, antibody, and the new addition, which is the low complement and the direct comb test that is accompanying the hemolytic uh, uh, anemia. Uh, 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 and of course, we must have a total of four features, at least one clinical and at least one from the immunologic column. So I need maybe one from the clinical features and three from the uh, immunologic features or three from the clinical features and one from the immunologic features. And of course, for the respect of our uh, dear nephrologists, we included the bios biopsy proven lupus nephritis with anti-double stranded DNA or positive anti-nuclear antibody alone as a sure criteria as according to SLEEK criteria to diagnose systemic lupus erythematosus. So the nephrologists were so happy with this uh, SLEEK criteria because it answered their uh, uh, questions. So out of those 17 criteria, 11 clinical and six uh, 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 laboratory, I need only four features. Uh, 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 but it must be four features uh, uh, affecting one from each column at least, or just, just, just biopsy proven lupus nephritis with positive uh, uh, laboratory tests like anti nuclear or anti double strand. So, this uh, made us have the possibilities of something called the definitive lupus definitive case of lupus. And as I said, this is the up to date uh, uh, um, information that. We did not omit the 1997 American College of Rheumatology criteria. So we say that the definite lupus is any patient that can fulfill four out of 11 criteria of ACR or can fulfill four out of 17 uh, uh, criteria of the SLIC, but of course with the, uh, 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 um, the must being uh, one of them clinical and one of them laboratory or the new addition is the biopsy proven lupus nephritis along with laboratory uh, uh, tests like the anti-nuclear or anti-double stranded. So if the patient does not fill any of those three definitive criteria, ACR, SLIC, or bi biopsy proven lupus nephritis with positive anti-nuclear or anti-double stranded, they have only two or three of the ACR uh, uh, or SLIC criteria with at least one other feature, they call it probable lupus. What are the other features commonly encountered with patients with lupus? Optic neuritis, aseptic meningitis, glomerular hematuria, pneumonitis, pulmonary hemorrhage or pulmonary hypertension, interstitial lung disease, the pulmonary infection in general, myocarditis, verrucous endocarditis, abdominal vasculitis, Reynolds phenomena, or the acute, uh, elevation of the acute phase reactions like this dementia rate and so on. So possible. Uh, uh, so we have now the definite lupus and probable lupus and less li likely something called possible lupus. Possible lupus is like saying to you, try to find another diagnosis, okay? It only matches one of the ACR or SLIC criteria in addition to one or two of the other uh, features listed uh, before. And uh, these patients usually uh, need further follow-up 
maybe later on with follow up more criteria will appear and more affection will uh, appear or maybe uh, they can even resolve and of course we have an entity called the undifferentiated connective tissue disease or uncertain uh, connective tissue uh, disease it is uh, uh, usually uh, something that is not meeting the criteria of systemic lupus uh, uh, and uh, may become another form of connective tissue disease now what are the laboratory tests we need okay we now know the anti-nuclear antibody the anti-extractable nuclear antigen because this is a very important serologic testing for lupus of course now we know the anti-double stranded and uh, anti-histone to differentiate it in patients with a drug induced lupus only if we suspect that we make the test of anti-histone anti-double stranded of course we know that it is present only in 70 percent of cases so it is not highly sensitive but it is highly a, a specific, uh, it is almost over uh, uh, 98 or 99 uh, uh, percent. Uh, it is very rare to find anti-double stranded uh, positive in non-lupus patients. Of course, there are some association like the anti-RNB or the uh, uh, antibodies of systemic sclerosis or Jogren syndrome like the SSA or well, previously known at, uh, as anti rho or the SSB, which is previously known as the anti-LA. Of course, there is consumption of the complement, affection of the kidney, so it's important to make uh, urine analysis, electrolytes, and for renal functions, it can affect the liver. And as we know, we can affect uh, so many parts from uh, the uh, 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 hematology. Now we get back to our three cases that we started the uh, lecture with. Case number one, of course, uh, I will uh, remind you of, uh, of, uh, of the case number one. Okay, anybody remember the case number one? Anybody? Okay, so we will go back to case number one. <laughs> I have a problem in, uh, in uh, the presentation to make this uh, go on. Okay, case number one, please come. Okay. Oh, okay, so case number one was a 25-year-old lady that is having affection in the joints and easy fatigability. Now we have her, remember that we, we had hemoglobin of 5.5. Of course, we now know that our provisional diagnosis now is, of course, systemic lupus, and we can find so many criteria if we apply the ACR criteria or the SLIC uh, criteria. And of course, the investigations to confirm the diagnosis is going to be the uh, positivity of anti-nuclear antibody, anti-double stranded. We want to make sure that there is no renal affection, so we will make the urine analysis and the serum creatinine. Of course, there's hemoglobin drop, and we want to know with, uh, whether this hemoglobin drop is due to uh, hemolytic anemia or not, so we will need to make the reticulocytic count, maybe the indirect bilirubin, and uh, 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 we can, of course, make the differential count. We will also uh, ask maybe for the complement to assess the activity. Okay, what are the causes of anemia in a patient of lupus? Of course, the commonest part is the autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It is going to be normocytic, normochromic anemia. The reticulocytic count is going to be uh, uh, high because the bone marrow will try to uh, uh, make uh, some, the, uh, to, to, to uh, replace the deficit that is happening by the destruction of RBCs. And we will find that there is indirect hyperbilirubinemia, elevation of the indirect uh, uh, bilirubin, and uh, of course, the positive COMB test, and if we just recall that the positive COMB test became one of the criteria according to the SLIC criteria now. Of course, anemia of chronic disease. It's a normocytic, normochronic anemia, and it will have elevation of uh, ferritin, and maybe the iron levels may be normal or may be uh, uh, diminished. What about iron deficiency anemia? As we said that one of the criteria of systemic lupus is having oral ulcers. So uh, of course there is something uh, called the GIT lupus or the affection in the gastrointestinal uh, tract. The affection of the gastrointestinal tract, it can cause ulcerations throughout the whole length of the gastrointestinal tract. And um, in the previous part, uh, era, we thought that it can only uh, cause a peptic ulcer, like uh, the ulcer in the stomach uh, or in the uh, duodenum. 
Uh, after that, when we introduced the uh, uh, something called the enteroscopy, and we went in depth into the small bowel, we started to find something like the abscess ulcerations or like the ulcerations we have seen in the picture of the uh, oral cavity. Similar lesions like that, we have found them in the jejunum and the rest of the small bowel. They are, will be oozing blood and making chronic blood loss causing iron deficiency anemia. Of course, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and the corticosteroids used for the treatment and the management of such patients also can add a factor in uh, decreasing the serum iron and decreasing, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, of the GIT loss. Of course, how we can diagnose iron deficiency anemia, we will find that the levels of the serum iron will be uh, low and the serum uh, ferritin also, which is the stores of the iron, will be low with the increase of the uh, capacity to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, bind the iron, which is the total iron binding capacity. And maybe if we make the test of occult blood in the stool, they become uh, positive. But of course, I will tell you some clinical part about the occult blood in the stool. We know that uh, in many cases, occult blood in the stool can be negative because uh, this particular sample of uh, stool did not contain blood and may be wrongly positive if the patient uh, have eaten uh, meat or took uh, iron supplements or uh, 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 having uh, some local disease like uh, piles or uh, uh, fissure in the, uh, uh, in the uh, external uh, part of the uh, GIT, which is the anus. Okay, so what, uh, what uh, these are the possibilities of uh, anemia in a case of uh, systemic uh, lupus. Of course, what are other abnormalities in the CBC? We know now leukopenia, lymphopenia, and thrombocytopenia, and we can know the uh, numbers of that, 3,500, 1,500, and 100,000 in two or more occasions. Okay, we remind you of case number two, which was the 24-year-old lady with the precordial pain what was the diagnosis? Now we now know that this diagnosis mo most probably is uh, pericarditis with pericardial effusion as a form of cirrhosis that is accompanying a case of lupus. The criteria for these patients, the Miller rash, the oral ulcers, the cirrhosis, the pericarditis, and the presence of uh, uh, leukopenia, uh, because uh, you remember the, the, the white cell count was 3,400 in this patient. But of course, anybody who's intelligent enough, he will tell to me, he will tell me, Dr. Mohammed, we need to repeat that. And it must be in two occasions. And I will say that is very clever. <laughs> you are right. <laughs> okay. We will need investigations to confirm the diagnosis. The investigations to confirm the diagnosis, of course, now it is more or less repeated. We will need to confirm the presence of lupus by anti-nuclear antibody, anti-double stranded, complement three, complement four, and anti-Smith. Uh, and we will need to confirm the pericardial affection by not only by the chest X-ray, which is showing the cardiomegaly, but by the echocardiography, which is the most sensitive to detect even the very small amount of pericardial uh, effusion. Uh, uh, for this uh, patient. Of course, we come to the last case, and by uh, it is worth uh, noting that these cases are coming from the book of the uh, uh, problem solving and the clinical scenario that is uh, done by the Department of Internal Medicine, and they come to you in the final uh, exam. Uh, uh, I think a whole paper is coming, uh, comes with uh, some similar uh, cases. So it is uh, very nice that we can discuss it now. So case number three, which was the 28-year-old lady that's having puffiness and eyelids, uh, 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 something like the generalized edema and puffiness of the eyelids, which is uh, almost pseudomonic to patients with having a proteinuria or nephrotic syndrome. But the problem of this patient, as we can remember, that she was having hypertension. Hypertension, which means that there is a disease activity now and it is causing uh, nephritis, not uh, uh, nephritic syndrome, along with the nephrotic syndrome. So it is a nephritic and the nephrotic uh, uh, syndrome. So uh, 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 this patient most probably will need a renal uh, biopsy uh, because she might be, uh, I think, class four or class five uh, uh, renal affection of uh, lupus. And of course, she will need to 
uh, uh, changes the uh, medications that she is uh, uh, taking. Uh, we will go to uh, how we can prove this uh, assumption. As we said, that this patient is having nephritic and nephrotic syndrome with or without renal impairment. So we will need to make full renal functions, abdominal ultrasound to make sure that this is acute renal insult. We will need urine analysis. We will need electrolytes, renal functions. And of course, in most of cases and almost all cases, the nephrologist will uh, need a renal biopsy for uh, such uh, a patient. And uh, a 24-hour urinary protein, serum albumin, uh, and of course, the other laboratory tests for the systemic uh, lupus erythematosus. What are uh, uh, the plans for us to treat uh, such uh, a patient? Of course, the very first and very important part uh, 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 for nephrologists is the control, the blood pressure. So when we find this question in the exam, we usually go directly to immunosuppression, cyclophosphamide, uh, mucophenol, and, and so on. And we always forget that this is a clinical case. Clinical case, you have to make sure to treat all the aspects of the case. So please do not remember, do not forget to, uh, uh, to say that you need to control the blood pressure. Okay, so control of blood pressure is some, uh, some of the most important targets. And of course, the treatment of lupus nephritis will depend on the class of lupus nephritis that have see, been seen uh, by the renal biopsy. And of course, it's going to be a combination of corticosteroids and other uh, immunosuppressive uh, drugs like the azathioprine and uh, cyclophosphamide and so on. And maybe this patient might need dialysis according to the criteria of dialysis. And as I said to you, don't forget to say that we need to control the blood pressure. And the, of course, in renal cases, uh, so long that the uh, kidney functions would uh, uh, admit that we would prefer the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor uh, blockers because they uh, make the, uh, the protonuria less and they are considered to be nephroprotective uh, in cases uh, which uh, do not have very uh, major renal uh, affection. Uh, by now, I think we have made an approach of a case of systemic lupus erythematosus. We have discussed three different uh, case uh, scenarios, one of them coming with the uh, musculoskeletal and the mucocutaneous along with anemia. A second case that is coming with an organ affection where there is affection of the pericardium, which is not uncommon. And the third case, which is very common in our medical practice, is a case of lupus that is coming with the renal affection. I think we still have like uh, 10 minutes or so. So we will allow uh, anybody who's having any questions or uh, any uh, um, uh, things that want to, them to be cleared. But of course, to organize it, we will not allow to uh, open or to unmute the mics unless two people who are raising uh, the, the hands. So anybody who's having a comment or having a question, please uh, be uh, free to raise your hand and ask your question and so on. Okay, so Dr. Izzeddin Hussein, okay, uh, <coughs> Doctor, what is the most uh, common cause of this? Of this, which is, what is this? Uh, what is the most cause of this in this patient? In this, uh, case? Cause of this in patients of systemic lupus and erythematosus, I think the renal affection. Reason affection. Any other questions? Hello, any other questions? <laughs> It is uh, five minutes to 10. So if anybody's still having any questions. Okay, so I think